Algorithms define our lives. Which political advertisements do you get to see on Facebook? Who gets a job? Who is being released from prison? With algorithms as the buzzword, an enormous efficiency operation is being conducted taking decision-making away from humans and handing them over to the rules and laws of the computer. Evangelists of data are pushing this vision that we should actually sort of hand over our free will to the computers. That's freaking nuts. But what are we surrendering to? So when you're giving over control, it's not to an algorithm, it's to a company. And until you get clear on that, you're gonna be taken advantage of. What does the world look like when algorithms determine our personal future? I'm almost a year out trying to change other people's lives. Um, had it been for a compass, I would still be in prison. There's no button in the app that says, hold on, I have a problem with my bike or... It's just being on or off. This is Backlight. Welcome to your digital future. The role computers play in our lives is changing. Where previously we viewed computers as a tool to help us make decisions, we now allow the computer, with the help of big data and algorithms, to take over an ever-increasing number of decisions about our lives. You know, the way I use the word algorithm is a, um, a predictive tool. So it's a tool that predicts success. Cathy O'Neill is a mathematician and data scientist. She worked on Wall Street for a large hedge fund, which she quit during the financial crisis of 2018. Since then, she has been conducting research into the role of algorithms in our lives. Um, to build an algorithm, you really only need two things. You need some kind of concept of historical information, like what happened in the past, and you need a very precise definition of success. So for example, on a daily basis, if you're deciding what to wear, um, you're going to care about what the clothes you have in your closet are, what, what, which of those clothes are clean, um, how much did they cost, how comfortable were they last time you wore them, do they fit you well, what's the temperature outside, what are you planning to do today? There's lots of data that you have on that day to think about, but really what you're doing is thinking back in the past, like when I wore this outfit before, like this is the problem I had with, or this is the risk of this outfit because sometimes when it's windy, the skirt flips up. You know, So you, you incorporate your different definitions of success, um, which is, are usually pretty complicated, um, as well as the kinds of risks that you have, you're taking in wearing a particular outfit. Um, when you build an algorithm with a computer, you have to make everything absolutely precise. And it's typically a sort of watered down toy version of something that you would do in your head. These computerized decision makers are taking over large parts of our lives. The bike route we take and who we fall in love with is today often determined by computer algorithms. And for some, this means that they literally spend their days being guided by computer code. People working at Deliveroo are just dispatchers, so it's the algorithm that decides where to send people. Basically, anytime you used to have a difficult human decision made by a process that was complicated and hard, now you'll see an algorithm. The algorithm is a mystery for us. We don't know how does it work. We are not, uh, nobody explained it to us. And the problem is that I have absolutely no control over the delivery system. I'm just waiting for the deliveries to come. The deliverer wants me to be there, to be on my shift, even if there are no, not enough orders to make a minimum wage. If there are no deliveries for whatever reason, then I'm not getting paid. The problem is that the algorithm just thinks about the profit. Algorithm is just uh, it's not a human being. It just has just being programmed to do one thing, and that's all it does. 
I think that we are now facing like a huge change and it, we will be getting more and more of this kind of jobs where people are pushed into precarious conditions where all the costs, the insurance costs and all the risks are pushed on the people but all the profit goes to the, to the company. Getting a job, keeping a job, assessments, um, scheduling jobs, that's also a complicated and difficult process that people get upset about. Um, anytime people can sidestep that part where people get upset because they think they're being unfairly treated, well, let's turn this into an algorithm and then we can say, talk to the machine, which is to say, don't talk to anyone because there is no way to talk to a machine. Algorithm doesn't have empathy, algorithm doesn't have any other goals than just to push as much as it possible from our work. Fuck the liberal! I think it's reasonable to think of it as sort of the automated version of a human process. Yeah. It's not new, it is just automated. So in some sense, um, an algorithm is a toy version, a very simplified, kind of stupid version of the human process it's replacing. Shit, I just got a flat tire. It is very problematic to put it on as well. It takes like hours sometimes. <laughs> Jesus fuck. I haven't seen anyone like in six months from the delivery. Or... Can you like tell the app that you have a, a flat tire or? I just have to log out and I will not be get paid for this time, of course for the cost, for the everything. Because there's no, there's no button in the app that says, uh, hold on, I have a problem with my bike or... No. It's just being on or off. Now that algorithms have taken over the work, for example, in the management of bike couriers, the question remains whether they are doing a good job. Micah Zelika is a data scientist and does research into the question of whether algorithms make good, objective decisions. People tend to think of an algorithm as being like isolated and able to, to actually think, but this is not the case. It is not really, really intelligent in, in the sense that we would define intelligence for, for human beings. People tend to think that big data and artificial intelligence is going to save our lives, right? So, and it was really like a gold digger atmosphere in the beginning because people were like, yeah, we just have a ton of data and we feed it into the algorithm and then it will tell us whatever we wanted to know. And this turned out to be wrong. and especially the data scientists and mathematicians were proclaiming that math is neutral and because it's all just math, it's, uh, it has to be fair and it has to be certainly fairer than human beings because there is no human being involved, right? There is just data and math, voila, beautiful. <laughs> and uh, so I think it was really hard for, to digest for them that their beloved algorithms could actually be worse than human beings. <laughs> Data is not neutral in itself, right? Because data is full of stereotypes, full of the concepts, and full of our culture, our certain culture that we are living in. There is like certain things where the whole world seems to agree on, um, but there's also a lot of things, like homosexuality is a very, um, a very common example for that, because there's a lot of societies where people think that this is a crime and this, that it is pervert and whatever. And, uh, there is also quite some societies nowadays who think it's just fine. And if you have criminal statistics that involve homosexuality, you would probably have like a lot more men there and stuff like that. The trouble is what do you do now, right? Because we have these biases in the data. And so the, this is what my whole research area is about, to discuss and to find solutions for different approaches to deal with this, because we just have to live with that. That's, we are, we are not going to get rid of this. Algorithms and the data with which they are being fed 
sometimes appear to make huge mistakes or be blatantly racist. For instance, an Asian resident of New Zealand was refused a passport because in his photo, his eyes were allegedly closed. And Google's advertising system showed well-paid jobs to men more often than to women. Why do these seemingly objective systems make such big mistakes? We're realizing that these algorithms are not, in fact, less biased than humans. Um, for two reasons, mostly. The first being that the data itself reflects human bias. So if you're thinking about deciding who was successful at a company in the past, you probably define success by you know, who got raises, who got promotions, who stayed for a long time. But if you think through those, all those examples, like they're all culturally defined. Who gets a raise? Who gets promoted? Who stays for a long time? Those are all things that the answer could be very different depending on whether the culture is sexist or racist or something like that. So when we are asking those questions and answering it with data, we are embedding the bias. Other kinds of data problems could be just missing data, that we simply do not have the data for some kinds of people. Um, and I would argue that when we talk about our, um, we talk about crime data, we don't really have crime data, but we use as a proxy, we use arrest data. But we really don't have consistent policies for who we arrest for what crimes. And in particular, we have a lot of missing, uh, missing arrest data. We don't arrest white people for smoking pot in this country nearly as much as we arrest black people for smoking pot. So the data itself is reflecting the human bias. The human bias, either by the, the, the bias in the data or the missing data. Even though algorithms are not perfect, in the United States, they are being used to make decisions previously made by judges. And of course, it then becomes quite important to know how great the margin of error is. I was trained on data in finance. And in finance, good enough is very, very low standard. The standard for good enough is you're right 51% of the time. You could make money if you're right 51% of the time. But in the context of putting someone in prison, that's definitely not good enough. It depends on the stakes. If the stakes are low, then who cares? It could just, as long as it's better than guessing, you know? But if the stakes are high, if somebody's human rights or constitutional rights can be violated if they're unfairly scored, it really matters whether you're wrong or right. When algorithms make decisions about an individual's life, it can have far-reaching consequences. Glenn Rodriguez discovered this to his cost. A judge decided on his conviction that he would become eligible for an early release after 26 years, but an algorithm disrupted this. Unfortunately, had it been uh, solely up to the Compass Risk Assessment, I would still be in prison yeah. today. And here it is, I'm almost a year out trying to change other people's lives. He's scheduled to be here today, and I was wondering what was going on. Um, I am a youth case manager. What I do, it's a lot like uh, what a probation officer would do. I have court-involved youth that I am charged with the task of monitoring. It's pretty much just making sure that they're doing all the right things. And doing the right thing means going to school, behaving at home, attending program, being home on time for curfew. Mm -hmm. A week. So if you miss a week straight, mm -hmm. um, we're obligated to notify the judge. Just like if you don't come here for two weeks straight. But you definitely got to start doing something different because this is not going to work. So this was a picture of me. This was the 16-year-old Glenn, the, the Glenn who committed the offenses for which I served uh, 26 and a half years. I committed a robbery, and in the process of that robbery, um, a person lost their life, and so I was charged with murder, robbery, and criminal possession of a weapon mm. at the age of 16. Um, Bad. Well, it could be a lot better, I'll tell you that much. Um, I'm going to show you right now. So I mean, I know I've definitely had worse. So the attendance, yeah, attendance here um, hasn't been the greatest. You know, you've actually you've done a lot better in the past. 
Um, you know, I come from a very dysfunctional family background. So my mother was murdered when I was a child at the age of three, and my father committed suicide when I was four. So I was raised by my grandmother. And so, you know, and growing up, I had a lot of self-esteem issues. And so this young man here mm -hmm. was the young man who would do anything to kind of prove himself to his friends and the people who he felt were cool and do anything to kind of fit in, mm -hmm. which is what led to my crime. Uh, it, it, this kind of reinforces the fact that, you know, um, what I'm doing uh, is, is the right thing at this point because I actually work with youth and oftentimes when I speak to them, I see myself in a lot of them. In the very beginning, just quite frankly, at that age, at, as a teen, I just didn't see the, the light. The way I saw things was like, oh, I'm gonna die in prison, this is it. Um, however, once I arrived at about the midway point of my sentence, I said to myself, you know what, if I did, if I did this long, if I made it this far, I can actually do this again. Mm -hmm. I can see myself doing the rest of this. So I started to get involved with a number of programs and I developed such a love for the program that I, 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 I didn't want to risk losing it. And so I started taking gradually, gradual steps and, and taking corrective measures to the point where um, I started adopting a lot of my own advice. Mm -hmm. After serving 20, 26 and a half years, you're eligible for parole. And what happens is you appear before a panel mm -hmm. of three parole board members, and they get to decide whether at that, at that particular point you are fit for society. They kind of ask you a series of questions, and based on your answers, it generates this, this bar chart that kind of gives them a snapshot of who you are. At the time that I went to my first parole hearing, mm -hmm. I hadn't had a misbehavior, misbehavior report in over a decade. However, because I had misbehavior report in the 90s, that document, for some reason, portrayed me as a very hostile individual, very violent. And so I was actually denied parole because of that. So this is the bar chart that was generated mm -hmm. um, as a result of all the questions. So it lists me as under prison misconduct as an eight, so high. Everything else is low. Unlikely, um, unlikely for this, unlikely for that low for risk of, re of committing another felony, low for risk, a one for arrest risk, for absconding risk, criminal involvement, I scored a one, which is the lowest you can get. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to prison misconduct, I scored an eight. And it all boils down to this section here. Question number 19, does this person appear to have notable disciplinary issues? This person noted yes. In my conversations, with, uh, with other convicts, um, it turns out that some of them who, for whom that question had been checked uh, no, mm -hmm. had received a lower score than I had, despite the fact that he had a stabbing incident just 26 months prior. Wow. As opposed to me, who didn't have one incident, any incidents of misbehavior in over a decade, they check yes and I score an eight. All right, what up, Saquon? Listen, they started that group, so um, yeah, I'm gonna show you where the group is. It's down the hall. I gotta show you. To challenging the compass risk assessment, um, uh, there's there's no transparency as to what the algorithm is and how these numbers are calculated. No one has a clue as to how this software is actually, how much weight is attributed to what questions. Yeah. And so, you know, whether or not there's actual bias built into this, no one would know. These algorithms, they're private companies that the government employs. Um, and, but because they're private companies, um, the algorithm is considered proprietary information and it's secretive. Everything is secret, it's a secret, you, can't, you have no access to it. And so my concern with it is that the bias can actually be built into the algorithm. And we would have no way of knowing that. In this country, um, usually when you have a trial or you're faced with criminal charges, you have the right to challenge the evidence that's presented against you. Mm -hmm. uh, a parole board is no different than a trial. Um, you're pretty much going there and you're trying to prove a case and they're tr they have evidence against you and they use it against you. And the algorithm happens to be part of that evidence. So you should be able to challenge that. And in order to challenge it successfully, it it's important to know how this is actually reaching the, the conclusions that it's reaching. Cynthia Conti-Cook is a lawyer and often takes on cases where an algorithm plays a role in the court's decision. She is familiar with the case of Glenn Rodriguez. Okay. 
when the judge is making a decision, the judge has to make a record about what factors they considered in coming to a final decision. And we, if we think that the judge has made the wrong decision based on that record, can appeal that decision and ask a higher court to review what the, the lower judge's thought processes were and yeah. whether they were in line with other laws like the Constitution. Mm -hmm. we, with an algorithmic model that sort of just pops out a yes or no answer, our attorneys don't have the opportunity, number one, in the first place to argue whether or not the tools come out with the right answer. And number two, in cases where the judges cannot override the decision made by the algorithmic uh, model, the judges themselves don't understand what is influencing um, its final outcome. And so it makes the process for reviewing either the judge's decision or the algorithmic model's decision completely impossible if you're the appellate judge trying to decide whether or not, for example, the constitutional constitution was followed. In a case like Glenn's, would you say the error is in the algorithm? I think it's probably two things. The error would be in the way that the that data point exists. So it, the general question, is this person a, a disciplinary problem, shouldn't even be included in there. Um, the other part of the problem is that based on sort of a very rough survey of maybe half a dozen of these, we think that that question is more heavily weighted than other questions. So we think that whether that question is yes or no, can be determinative of whether someone is low or medium risk mm -hmm. when other questions might not be as determinative. I've been out now approximately, what, going on 10 months now? I'm sure you remember the day that you... May 11th, yes, I never forget that day. Yeah. What was it like to step outside after such a long time? Oh man, uh, I, I, listen, Forget the day, the day I got the decision, because they give you the paperwork first and they tell you you're leaving. That day I was like crying uncontrollably when I read that paper. They, get, you know, they call you down to the counsel's office and they issue you an envelope that's sealed and you don't know what's in there. It, it's, it can be very easily be a denial as it can be a, a, a release. So when I opened that and I was kind of hesitant to unfold as I unfolded the sheets of paper and when I finally saw the result, I just started crying uncontrollably. I, I just couldn't contain myself because the day that I had hoped for and wished for for so long, um, you know, had finally come. The Compass algorithm which determined whether Glenn Rodriguez could be released early, is under close scrutiny in the United States. Thanks largely to research conducted by the journalistic non-profit organization ProPublica, which investigates just how precise these risk scores actually are. And this is a Nerd Alley. So this is our whole data journalism nerd team, which they don't mind being called. <laughs> I think we're best known for our analysis of criminal risk scores. So mm -hmm. this is software that's used across the US to give a score predicting whether somebody who has been arrested is likely to go on to commit future crimes mm -hmm. in the next two years. And so this is you know, software that has not been analyzed by anyone independently. So we went and obtained through public records requests the scores that were assigned to 18,000 people in two years in one jurisdiction in Florida. And then we went to see, well, was it accurate? Did they really truly predict whether those people went on to commit crimes? And it was only about 60% accurate, so a little bit better than a coin toss. But when it was wrong, it was wrong really differently. It was twice as likely to say that a black defendant was gonna commit a crime when they actually weren't, and it was twice as likely to say a white defendant would not go on to commit a crime when they did. So it had a real disparity in the error rates, which was something that no one in that field had ever really noticed or recognized before, and it's kicked off like a nationwide debate in computer science about how to balance these type of error rates in the future. I've been looking at algorithms in all sorts of fields, so um, Facebook algorithms, um, I've been looking at algorithms used by Amazon, algorithms um, used by the car insurance industry to set prices, so kind of anywhere that I can find an algorithm that has really high stakes in the result. Mm -hmm. And I mean, are there many places where you can find these algorithms now? Oh, there's more algorithms than I could possibly <laughs> tackle. Um, you know, we're in the process of 
automating everything in the world, right? And that's got a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we'll never have to drive again, but it also means that we're turning over to computers a lot of decision making and a lot of that is really opaque and we don't have independent regulators or independent ways of analyzing mm -hmm. those decisions. And so that's what I'm trying to do. You know, I wish I had a name for it. I think it needs a name, this new field. You know, I call it data journalism, but that means a lot of things to a lot of people. But, you know, I think of it as truly driven by the scientific method, the idea that you come up with a hypothesis, you test it, find the data, see if there's enough evidence to support your hypothesis, and that you use teams to do investigations. You know, we have a researcher, a programmer, me, you know, so the idea of like an interdisciplinary team tackling some really hard questions. It feels a little bit like science. <laughs> So I've been looking at Facebook um, mostly because I just, the, the question that I was really wondering was like, what happened in 2016? Like, what happened on Facebook? You know, there's a lot of theories about whether Trump had better ads or Hillary, you know, didn't have a good strategy or whatever. But the truth is, we don't know because you can't see those ads. You know, it's not like a TV ad or a print ad where you can, everyone in the world sees it. The only people who see the ad are the person to whom it was targeted. So I wanted to make sure that future elections weren't that opaque. And so we built this tool to basically allow people to donate to us the ads that they see on their Facebook news feed. So we have thousands of users who use this little tool. And whenever ads show up on their feed, it gets sent into our big database. Then we had to build an algorithm, actually, <laughs> to do algorithm reporting. So we built an algorithm to determine which ones are political ads and which ones are not and we sort them out and then we display the political ones to the public so that the public can see in real time what kind of ads are happening on Facebook. Now we don't have all the ads on Facebook. We have a small sample, but we're hoping by extending this tool around the world that we'll get a lot of them. What percentage of a newsroom will be like programmers and people writing algorithms rather than do sort of like traditional journalism you think in the 10 or 20 years? We have at least 10 or 15 people on that. So mm -hmm. that's pretty sizable considering that we're 100 people max. Um, but I do think in the future it's going to be more important. And I hope that newsrooms will get funded to do that because that's, um, that's the real question that's holding back. It's not lack of interest. It's the lack of a business model for the news business. Meet Maddie, my programmer. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, do you want to go to her desk? Yes. Okay, let's. Yes, that's good. I do everything from uh, writing bots that sort of crawl around the internet and sort of gather information to um, like pulling huge data sets from like large filings. Um, we trying to understand from the outside what a lot of these companies are up to. I will tell you the one algorithm that's really hard to analyze and that I think is really important mm -hmm. and that I'm frustrated that I haven't gotten my hands on is the Facebook news feed. So how and why Facebook decides what things to rank higher and lower, as you know, it's become like a societal conversation, you know, about mm -hmm. whether they're like putting fake news too high. But the fact that that thing is so unanalyzable is like an endless frustration to me. <laughs> The Facebook algorithm, seen by many as the most influential in the world, is receiving a great deal of criticism recently, because the way the algorithms function on social media do not always appear to correspond with the user's interests. We define success in a very narrow, biased way in the way that works for us, but not, doesn't work necessarily for the people we're targeting, doesn't work necessarily for the, for the public good. The, I think a good example there is the Facebook algorithm. The Facebook newsfeed algorithm has been optimized to, um, to engagement, which is to say to keeping us on Facebook, which is a proxy for their profit. But it has not been optimized to something that would actually be good for the public, namely truth or civil dialogue or, um, or just knowledge or information.
With their primary goal being to get us to click and spend as much time online as possible, Facebook and Google's algorithms appear to have gone wild in recent years. Jaron Lanier, a tech pioneer and writer, observed with ever-increasing wonder several online protest movements and the backlashes against them. We can observe a pattern that's repeated multiple times, and I think we should accept it as a phenomenon that um, is real. And the, the, the phenomenon is that somebody uses modern social media in a political way, uh, as a social movement, as a political movement, to improve the world. And then, somehow, in the same setting, other people come along who are not just bad actors, but horrible actors, and then apply the same techniques to make the world worse, and much worse. So the backlash is, is more than one would expect. Now, um, throughout history, there have been plenty of backlashes against social movements, and yet, lately, we've seen a series of backlashes that are really extraordinary. So one example um, was the Arab Spring. So when the Arab Spring started in Silicon Valley, there was all this self-congratulations, you know, like it is the Facebook revolution, it's the Twitter revolution, and all we have to do is let these people use our social media tools and there will be peace on earth and prosperity for everyone. But then what happened after a while is a, is a much more difficult outcome where, um, uh, and for various reasons, and, and it's different in each country and it's not as bad in some as in others, but we tended to end up with um, a, a, a reign of terror more than a, a rise of democracy and, uh, and, and prosperity. And we're still not through that. So the question is, why are the backlashes worse than the movements? And the reason why is that the social media by itself doesn't do anything. It's waiting for energy coming in from people. It's people's attention and interest that is the fuel that allows the social media engines to make money through engagement. And so when uh, the, oftentimes the social movements are started by young idealistic people who are the most engaged, the most tech savvy, as they say, the most able to do so. And they start generating engagement. The, the, young, the young people in the Arab Spring, the young people in Black Lives Matter and so forth. So suddenly they have input this fuel into the system. Now the algorithms have to say, what can we do with this fuel? And so one option is we will allow this fuel to only engage those people who started it. That is not very efficient. What's more efficient is to say, how can we use this fuel to engage other people? And let us be clear about something. There is a, an asymmetry, which is tragic, but is very real. And the asymmetry is that negative emotions are more engaging and powerful and easier to bring up and efficient and profitable and intense than positive emotions. So if you have all these positive emotions coming in saying, we want something better, we want to support these people, the algorithms naturally, without any evil plan, will turn them into negativity by finding the people who are annoyed, the anti-people, and milking and milking and milking because negativity is more efficient, more profitable, more engaging. So if you want to have an anti-fascist message, that'll be used to find all the fascists and introduce them to each other and put them into a cycle of more and more and more incitement. And that is the only way for these companies under their present business models to maximize their engagement and maximize their profits. The key issue here is addiction, and, which, and the term within Silicon Valley for addiction is engagement. That's our, our sanitized term. Two of the biggest tech companies make almost all their money from addicting people to services, manipulating their behavior for pay, and in order to do that, they must emphasize negative emotions like fear, resentment, and hostility, 
over positive emotions because that's more efficient. And those two companies are Google and Facebook, and they must change their business model or else humanity will not survive. So when you're giving over control, it's not to an algorithm, it's to a company. And until you get clear on that, you're gonna be taken advantage of. And these companies appear to do far more than simply show us personalized advertisements. The British company Cambridge Analytica, for example, used Facebook data to analyze how American voters could be manipulated. Psychologist and data scientist Michael Kozinski designed a model to psychologically analyze people based upon their Facebook profile, but then refused to sell his model to Cambridge Analytica. And yet the company still used Kozinski's method on the Facebook data of 87 million Americans. At the time, do you think they copied or stole your research? It doesn't really matter, because these days computers are doing science which basically means that if you know that something is possible, you don't need to know my magic sauce and my magic equation. You just ask your own computer to devise, to design your own. So it doesn't really matter. The, um, these days, computers are doing science and not humans. Cambridge Analytica uses what Kaczynski calls psychographics, a model in which an algorithm uses online data to exactly determine someone's personality. With this extensive knowledge, the best way to influence people during elections can then be determined. Alexander Nix, the suspended CEO of Cambridge Analytica, explains. Because it's personality that drives behaviour, and behaviour that obviously influences how you vote. So if I'm a human psychologist, and my brain is just a human brain, I'm limited to those like systems, models that contain five variables, or maybe seven variables, or maybe 10, or maybe 16 variables. That's what humans can handle. Now, if you're an AI psychologist, if you're a computer algorithm, you do not have to reduce people to five numbers. You can, well, from statistical point of view and from uh, a predictive power point of view, it's still actually worth to reduce people somewhat to, to lower um, uh, kind of uh, to less dimensions, but you would reduce them to 500 numbers or 5,000 numbers. Now, you would actually call those 5,000 numbers 5,000 psychodemographic traits, something akin to personality. But it's way more complicated and allows you to capture way more variance in human behavior, it allows you to be way more accurate about predicting the future. We should be afraid and we should be cautious because algorithms Artificial intelligence, like any new technology, is first of all, we don't really understand it very well. It definitely brings a lot of risks, as well as great, amazing advantages. Now, we've seen it in the past with nearly any new technology that humanity came up with, that there were advantages and disadvantages of it. Now, in order to reap the advantages and to avoid the risks, we have to talk about the negative side of things. We have to be worried of manipulation, of abuse of AI, and maybe AI doing things that are undesirable. Al computer algorithms are getting better at turning the digital footprints of behavior that we're leaving behind into very accurate predictions of our future behavior and of our intimate traits. On the other hand, we are leaving an increasing amount of digital footprints behind because we are increasingly surrounded by digital products and services. You want to walk around with your face uncovered and talk to people freely. Now, just this data that we voluntarily leave behind is already enough for a good algorithm to create a very good prediction of who we are and what are we going to do in the future. So it's basically... On the basis of facial traits. Or, like my recent research suggests, even based on a still image of your face, the computer algorithm can reveal a lot about uh, our psychological or demographic, psychodemographic uh, traits. So now going forward, we basically going to have to no privacy whatsoever. And the sooner we start talking about how to make sure that the world, when there's no privacy, is still a habitable and safe and nice place to live in, the sooner that the basically the, the, the larger our chances that we'll be able to survive.
this uh, transition and not only survive on the individual level, but also survive as societies, as democracies. Do you believe that this is just like a temporary phase where we have these crude algorithms, but they will work better in the future automatically? Yeah, I do think that's true. Um, I don't necessarily think that's good. <laughs> Sometimes things work really well and they're evil, just to be clear. Things that predict poverty or predict wealth can work really well. And it, the better they work, the better they can cause poverty and cause wealth. I think the most important point is that algorithms don't just predict the future, they cause the future. Because all algorithms are actually working in concert with each other. And they are separating the winners from the losers in similar ways. And as they get better and better at that job of separating winners from losers, they're causing winners and causing losers because they're not saying, oh, you're losers, we're gonna help you get to be winners. That's not what they do because they're built by individual companies that are looking to profit. The larger point is that as they get better and better, that's a problem for us. That's when they get more efficient at increasing inequality, unless they're used for good. Like I'm not saying that that has to happen. We could have very accurate algorithms that do good. But right now, they're being used to commoditize us. And they're very good at it, and they're getting better at it. We are no longer, in other words, we are no longer seen as human people, you know, who deserve dignity just by dint of being humans, as citizens of the world. We are seen as potential purchasers. So if we are not high value customers, then we do not exist. And, and that's, that's how we're sized up. So when you, when you talk about algorithms getting really good at their job, I'm, it makes me worried. Mm -hmm. I actually kind of like that they're bad at it sometimes. I'd like to thank everyone for showing up, first of all. I greatly appreciate everyone showing up to try and get our message across to the folks in there. There is a conflict between us and the algorithm. It's being programmed to bring the company the biggest profit possible, no matter the costs. And the algorithm doesn't care because all the costs are pushed on the workers. Foodora announced one day before this protest, surprise, surprise, they're going to start covering our repair costs. They said they're going to give us a quarter of a euro extra per hour worked to cover our repairs, up to a maximum of 42 euros a month. This is a bloody insult. This is not realistic. Think about your bike now. Think about the work that it needs already. Then think about how much work it would need if you actually worked 168 hours in a month. We effectively earn less than minimum wage. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, sorry. As you can tell, this makes me kind of angry. So, just, you know, to make sure they get the message, I brought them a present. Please feel free to toss them there. How do you see uh, your future? Do you see algorithms in every major life decision that is there? I feel like that's already true. Um, you know, people talk about the singularity. They talk about the singularity is the moment when computers take over. I don't worry about that at all. I feel like we are handing our, ourselves over to the computers. We're doing it. It's our singularity. There are actually people, the evangelists of data from Silicon Valley, who are pushing this vision that the algorithms that are so good at predicting for us should be given more power, that we should 
we should listen to the algorithms to decide who to marry and what, what career to have and you know, where to go to school, that we should actually sort of hand over our free will to the computers. That's freaking nuts. It is freaking nuts. Technology should be giving us more options, not less. We are becoming slaves to the technology. We are entering in that vision of the world, like we are enslaving ourselves to this technology. It makes no sense to me. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.